Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Bill Reed Gallery's presentation of uh, Yagudangang to pay respect. Uh, the looking at and hearing from our guest speakers, Lucy Bell and Mika Collison about the repatriation journey of the Haida people. And it's really a great pleasure for us to be here today. We have this wonderful exhibition on at the Bill Reed Gallery right now, the Yagudangang Show, which was uh, is on loan to us, or it's a smaller version of a bigger exhibition that's on loan to us from the Haida Gwaii Museum. And so we were really excited to have Lucy and Mika uh, join us to speak more about uh, the repatriation journey, all of the information that's behind the exhibition, and also about the repatriation uh, committee of the Haida people. I did want to acknowledge that the Bill Reed Gallery is situated in Vancouver, so we are on currently on the unceded ancestral territories of the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the tsleil people, and we're very honored to, to live and work here on a regular basis. The gallery does represent um, the art, contemporary art of Bill Reed and all of the Northwest Coast nations, so uh, we are also happy to be working up and down the coast with people from up and down the coast. Um, I would also like to acknowledge that uh, this uh, speaker series that this uh, uh, webinar is part of is part of the To Speak with the Golden Voice exhibition speaker series, which is co-presented by the Bill Reed Gallery and the Bill Reed, um, the Indigenous Studies Department at SFU. So thank you to, so much to them for their help. Uh, so with that, I would really like to turn it over to our guest speakers, Lucy and Nika, and allow them to introduce themselves. And then I know they've got some wonderful slides and all sorts of amazing things to share with us. And I will uh, turn off my video and then uh, pop back in at the end. Oh, uh, I was going to mention that we are going to have a Q&A session. So please put your questions into the Q&A box and we will be speaking. Lucy and Mika will speak uh, for about 40 minutes and then we'll have the last part of our hour uh, to answer questions. So thanks so much and see you. Th there we go. Sing a last detail long stuff. Carlos Henudikian, Chich Gittens, Stu Diasgagum. It conisi hadas iskan gingi koyas di koya uslan. Haida Repatriation Committee, the lung di koyadam. How ah, my name is Lucy Bell, Stokawas, and I come from the Chichkitne clan on Haida Gwai. I feel very blessed to be home on Haida Gwai to be giving this talk. I'm a little bit sad I'm not sitting beside Mika today, um, but that, that will happen, and I'm, and I'm feel very honored to have been invited by the Bill Reed Gallery by Beth to speak about our repatriation journey with my good friend Mika. Mika, introduce yourself. Kawa di tahui khairagat la sistalan wa luhan gasul kel la di khairaga wa gindi khayathlanas slash tah khairaga. Uh, Haida Gwaii Museum, South Linden I D Skangul uh, Haga. Wagin uh, it kunisi u to yahgudangang we how well. So we're here today, sorry, I forgot I was continuing on from there. Uh, in English too, I suppose I should say my name is Nika. And I work at the Haida Gwaii Museum and, you know, Lucy sent her love and I sent my love to our people and our ancestors. So we thought in uh, going through some of the Haida repatriation journey, we have a flow of setting context. How did we wind up here today? And then Lou will talk about uh, our ancestors and, and our journey there and her personal journey because she is the leader of, of our repatriation movement. We'll move then into the living connections Hello. between ourselves and our ancestral treasures and belongings. We'll move from that into a, some of our personal museum or experiences with Western museums. 
And then we'd like to speak briefly as well about the Indigenous Repatriation Handbook that Lou and Luann Neal and myself wrote. And we'll follow it up with a brief overview of the exhibition that Beth spoke to in the beginning of the uh, talk, uh, where, where we first created it and hosted it at our Haida Gwaii Museum. And then we'll go into questions and answers from as far as I can tell. So I'm going to try and share my screen. Lou, have ha Lou and I have put together some images for as we go along. Can everyone see? Okay, Beth, are we on the screen, Lou, the yep. image? Yep. Okay. Excellent. So in understanding how we are here today sharing with our friends and allies online, uh, it, it, it actually starts from before human occupation on earth, but to fast forward ourselves uh, over millennia in the sake of time. First, first accepted Western documentation of contact between our people and Europeans or, or foreigners of that sort was in 1774. And shortly after a huge fur trade, a maritime fur trade occurred, and uh, we were we participated in that. Uh, when when the sea otter were hunted to near extinction due to the demand and and how capitalism can you know hit all our minds, uh, capitalism became stronger in the in the visitors' minds, the Europeans and and British. And as their economy started to wane, they began to look towards land occupation, which they'd been doing for a few hundred years earlier, moving from the west or the east coast of Turtle Island towards the west. Uh, by 1862, uh, they had stopped making treaties across Canada, partly uh, as their colonial regimes grew and partly because um, as the word on treaties grew, our people on the coast didn't, were not interested in entering into them because of the problems that occurred. So uh, I guess the best way to put it is that the, the colonizers in, introduced smallpox to, to the coast, and this was a, a known uh, form of cultural genocide that had been through colonial eyes very successful in the South in what we now know as the United States. And they withheld vaccinations from specific nations like the Haida, and through that, uh, the, the smallpox spread. Uh, there was also purposeful dumping, I suppose, uh, of, of people infected with smallpox onto our islands. So, so before this, there were a couple of less uh, um, impact on our people, and my understanding is unintended, like unintentionally placed waves of smallpox that traveled, you know, faster than the... Um, then the colonizers in some ways and in others uh, slowed down. So when you go from over 10,000 people upwards of 30,000 people in, in you know, about a hundred year time, and by 1915, you le have less than 600 on Haida Gwaii and about 400 in Alaska of Haida people. That's an incredible uh, trauma and, and great loss that we still feel today through inter intergenerational passing down. Despite this, this colonial genocide and followed by, or pardon me, a biological genocide followed by, by a cultural genocide, you know, these, these moments in between 1862 high tide and um, 1915, we still actively thrive. The, the survivors actively thrived and, and evidence of that is this archival photo here of Chief Nankaitz Lugas, who is standing in front of his house where people always want to go in the village of Haina, one of, one of my clan's ancestral villages. And this is in 1888. Uh, that doesn't mean that pillaging and, and uh, the force of handing over our treasures had not begun. By 1897, there was really active uh, taking of our ancestral remains. Uh, that had begun before this letter that you can see in the lower uh, left corner written by George Dorsey, a uh, collector of the day, and Charles Newcomb, a collector of the day, which reads, will you kindly send me more information about the totem pole you wish to dispose of, also about any duplicate specimens you may be willing to sell? 
Have you any skulls or skeletons that you will sell or exchange? The, the wild thing about this, this letter before I hand it over to Lou to talk more about how this movement began is that in 2003, we planned and worked a long time to go to the Chicago Field Museum to bring home the ancestral remains of 168 of our ancestors. And um, we'd set our reburial dates, you know, long before we went as well. Uh, just before we went, I was going through uh, Newcomb's fawns, you know, like records of his writings and found this letter. And what was, it, that was a very hard letter to find. But the, the beauty in it is that that, Ty, can you turn my phone off, please? Sorry, we're doing this from home. Um, the, the beautiful full circle thing that happened within it is that this letter was written on October 26, 1897. And we'd already set the date for October 26, 2003 to rebury the ancestors we brought home from the Chicago Field Museum and how they got there was from collectors George Dorsey and Charles Newcomb. So that full circle of trauma and psychological and physical violence, that, that, that instant within our greater history came full circle. But there are many circles surrounding that one example that are, have not connected in its entirety, and that's the work we continue to do. Okay, my turn to talk. Uh, I'm I'm going to touch touch base on how we we got to be repatriating um, our ancestors and our belongings. So. The, I think the creation of the Haida Repatriation Committee uh, began when uh, I was an intern at the Royal BC Museum. And um, it's interesting that you, you speak about the signs, Nika, and that's totally what I experienced my, myself was at, at the museum hearing the ancestors um, hearing the, the spirit of, of children in the, in the museum and um, taking that message home to the, to the Haida and um, expecting, expecting my relatives and friends back home on Haida Gwaii, everybody older than me and wiser than me to, to do something about it, but um, to be told that this was my, my journey and my calling and being told to just get on with it, get to work and that led to the creation of the Haida Repatriation Committee. Um, and it really was a beautiful bringing together of our nations, bringing of our nation, of our communities, and bringing together of, of our families, of our friends, connecting us to our ancestors, to our language, to some of these, um, belongings in museums all over the world. And uh, I don't think I knew it at the time, probably, I don't know, did you know, Nika, that this would be a lifelong <laughs> journey for us? It really, I think it really has been a calling for many of us. And um, I'm just so, so proud to be a part of that and proud to have passed that learning on. In, in the slides before you, you see, um, young people making Bentwood boxes. You see my daughter Amelia carrying a Bentwood box of, uh, of an ancestor to be uh, reburied. This really has been intergenerational healing um, for us. Oh, look at you trying so hard to get our, our pictures back up. <laughs> Here we go. While you're doing that, I'll just mention that we've been repatriating, um, the, the committee has been repatriating since, uh, what, 1996? 
Does that sound right? Uh, up until today, and to date, we've brought home over 500 of our ancestors. Um, and this, you, in that this slide here, you'll see Andy Wilson uh, and some the uh, kids um, making these beautiful bentwood boxes. And you'll see, um, I don't have my glasses on. I think that's Jenny at the bottom uh, preparing food for food offerings for our ancestors. Okay, we're back up. So you can keep, keep moving onto your slide next, I think, Nika. Hi, Liz, sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, so there's the bring, there's the honoring and respecting of our ancestors and Lou again, how, uh, how uh, so much for taking on the responsibility and, and leading the way and um, making room for everyone as we started to understand, uh, bringing us all in, bringing the entire intergenerational community all in and, and extending it, extending it to our friends and allies, the, the, the work. So when we visit our when we visit our collections in museums around the world, we we often bring huge delegations and you know again intergenerational, uh, spanning all ages, and we we go to to establish relationships with museums. We're mandated by our Haida Nation to approach re, uh, repatriation with the goal of mutual respect, cooperation, and trust. So when we go there, we're building relationships where uh, we know, like Lou said, this is lifetime, this is real life. And, and in that we have to, uh, that means we're not in a silo. It involves the other side, for lack of a better word. And, and that's a really transformative and important part of repatriation is we all need to learn about and accept the, the real past and existing history of Indigenous and Canadian uh, governments and peoples. Uh, then you need to find your grief. And then you need to make things right. And then you can move forward. So part of that when we visit is, is visiting our belongings and our ancestral treasures and the connections are not only that we know these are our ancestors that we're connected them, to them bef between that, but there's familial connections that are directly known. A quick example here is at the American Museum of Natural History. The drawing on the bottom is done by my great great grandfather, John Cross, a, a grandfather to many that depicts the first uh, tree to grow on Haida Gwaii after the last ice age, which is the earth or pine tree. And science has recently discovered using our knowledge of oral histories that indeed the first tree to grow on Haida Gwaii uh, was the earth, uh, the, the pine tree. Uh, on the top, this while this, while this incredible bentwood dish, uh, we do not know the, the Haida artist who created it, but it, this was one of Bill's most favorite and, and, and held up pieces and he dubbed it, uh, Bill Reed's most favorite pieces and he dubbed it the final exam, meaning if you can reach this, this level of design um, and understanding, it, it is an exam that you can pass. Uh, I've known about it always, but to be able to go to the museum, I didn't even know it was there and to see it and immediately go, oh my God, and start crying because this is part of my grandfather's love. So there's personal connections like that. Oh, am I on? If uh, you wouldn't mind, uh, I will talk about the mountain goat chest later when I can get the screen up. So do you want to talk about uh, your, your experiences with museums, with Western museums while I figure this out? Oh, that's a big, a big topic, um, Nika. Uh, <laughs> we, the Haida Repatriation Committee has visited museums all over the globe and we really made it a priority to bring delegations. It wasn't just, just a couple of people going, you know, we couldn't, I, I think I got used to traveling only with a big delegation. It felt very strange to travel just by myself. Um, but how 
how beautiful it was for us to go to museums as a whole group and be learning and seeing our ancestors um, treasures their creations and to be holding them and loving them um, together and um, i just loved learning together with with everybody i can say that it wasn't an easy journey um i do have hope that museums are growing and and coming along and changing um i think in in my experience the further away we got from haida Gwaii, the more difficult it was to have real relationships with museums and the people that work there and to even have access to our belongings and our our ancestors to be invited you know we i remember writing letters there was no internet um back then writing writing to get into museums in europe and saying hey we're coming to coming to europe um we'll be there in six months we want to come and see our our treasures and then to be receiving letters back saying sorry we're busy uh, <laughs> that that was um a, a shock you know we're we're that's not the kind of host that that we've grown up to be so to receive such um disrespect was very difficult um and it does i think we experience it every time we've gone on a repatriation trip saying they're too busy um saying that uh you know trying trying to get us to squabble over our ancestors um you know being told that oh those those haida ancestors don't come from haida Gwaii. um being told that the haida um, don't have a right to pick and choose what items to repatriate being told that we can't treat the museum like a grocery store um, you know we're still hearing these things today it's ridiculous um, and if I think if museums want to fight with us keep saying those things all it all it's going to do is is um, piss us off and make us dig our heels in more but we we've always approached it with with respect and trying to find out find find ways of being of working in friendship and collaboration and it's just once in a while there you know so there's there's some shady things that happen but overall i think museum we we have done a really good job i think of of instigating reconciliation before reconciliation was such a big word thrown thrown around we we were getting pretty we got pretty good at it i think nika okay you got your slides back up okay you're up unmute okay how are you and it is it it's it's not uh, i think too I, I love hearing what lou just said because we have always been incredibly diplomatic and in what we what we celebrate to the world is what is possible and the good motions that we make forward but it doesn't mean there's not stories behind and with all of this um it's all of these movements and and revealings and 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 getting tired you know that's where we are uh we've made progress we've made progress with allies but we're tired you know this is 25 years plus um we should be farther ahead and so I want to show an example that is both incredible and beautiful, but also reflects uh, the responsibility that society has to make change. Um, when we went to, and, and the American Museum of Natural History is who I'm speaking of, and they are our friends. Um, we first went there in 2002 to bring home the remains of uh, 48 of our relatives. And uh, even, even getting through there, it, it took a while. I actually wasn't part of the, of the initiating the relationship. By the time I got in, they'd, they'd agreed to do it and, and then changed their mind. And, and what was really nice is the new curator uh, did a coastal, you know, like a, a visit along the coast to get to know people. So when he came to Haida Gwaii, we more or less kidnapped him and, and two of his three days were actually spent 
going going to skiddy get an old masset to see the work we do to see the children involved to see where we rebury our ancestors and within three weeks of him getting back to the museum they said yes so you can see there's relationships that do need to happen um, even if we have to trick you know once in a while people into them uh, we went and of course we visited our collections and this chest was was in the storage room of the New York Museum. As soon as we saw it, we knew it, it was of the Gagyal's Pigalai or Skidan's clan. And this was in 2002 and we've maintained relationships with the museum, went back and got another 12 ancestors in 2014. Um, Come 2017, we'd negotiated, and with enthusiasm of the New York Museum, this ancient chest to come home to participate uh, in, in a very important potlatch in Haida history, which was the potlatch of inaugurating Gdansta. Gujao took on the responsibility in the name of Gdansta, and it was integral, it was critical that this chest come home and participate in that potlatch. Uh, the chest left Haida Gwaii in 1901, so 116 years later, it came back to Haida Gwaii. And it's the one on the right now, you're seeing the moon side of it. The, the moon is the highest crest of the uh, chief of the Gagyals, Ki Gawai. Uh, from it, 25 coppers, ceremonial coppers were given out. It was an historic, in, in a historic moment. And I'll take a moment to say this chest on the right or left, was uh, is a recreation of a masterful chest held at the Pitt Rivers Museum that Gdansta's two sons made. So these are both uh, actually the first time, or you know, these pieces came home in their different iterations to participate in life again, to participate in what they were made for. After, af uh, and uh, after that, we put the. Uh, our ancestral treasure into our museum where it was actually uh, shared uh, with with everyone and, and lived in our museum for two and a half years. During that time we made a plan and we had the the chest recreated by Gu Zhao's Gdansta's sons um, Jolin and Guai and their nephew um, Tyler. Uh, that that was that participated in an exhibition we'll talk to a little closer to the end. Um, but what I want to say is after uh, just before the exhibition ended, uh, this beautiful chest uh, went back to New York. The, the loan was over. And, the, you know, so then this is what is left two and a half years later. And 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 sure, we have this one. And, and this is a very important one. But to bring this chest home cost over $200,000 and a heck of a lot more of our time, as Lou has pointed out. So I think uh, I don't, I'm not taking down the New York, the American Museum of Natural History when I say this. This isn't limited to an institution. This is everyone's responsibility to not put onus of hours and like thousands of hours of our own time, unpaid time, and then over $200,000 just so we could get this ancestral chest home so we could honor and respect it and let it live. And then it goes away again. So there's beauty in the story, but there's a lot more work to do. Oh, okay. I'm. I'll take a moment to to talk about the Indigenous Repatriation Handbook. Uh, this was created uh, at the Royal BC Museum. Nika and Luann Neal and I created this handbook to help Indigenous uh, people involved in repatriation and to give some, some practical uh, tips and um, give some uh, case study. Uh, and it's been uh, quite well received. And uh, it's surprisingly uh, a handbook that is really used in, in 
international museums as well, which is uh, a nice, it's a really nice, nice surprise. And I hope that we can continue to be telling our stories, you know, the, the good, the bad, the ugly, and, and uh, to keep sharing strategies for moving repatriation forward. And this is available online um, at the Royal BC Museum website um, if you'd like to download it or you can buy it. And <laughs> okay, that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, there was a con like you organized a conference that you felt was very necessary and it was an indigenous repatriation conference and and this was what you determined was the most important or the the first thing that needed to come out right yeah that was when when the provincial government gave money to the royal bc museum to do something about repatriation the first thing that we did was host a repatriation conference and ask indigenous people and museums what would be most helpful what can we do to, to keep moving repatriation along in a, in a positive way and so many of the participants at the conference um, were just starting their repatriation journey and looking to us for advice on how to even get started so this was this was um, our res response uh, one of the responses to their requests. And and I have to say how fun, like it was very emotional. It was so like you're, you feel stressed because you really want to make sure that the context is provided, that, that there's beautiful things that can come out of it. It's coming from an Indigenous worldview and it felt pretty fun. And I don't say this uh, disrespectfully, it felt fun to write about museum people Western Museum people in the sense of we're saying, you know, our, you know, museum workers and, and to be able to, to look at their social side of things and, and, and um, see how we can make space for ourselves within that world or how they can make space for us in that world. So it was just kind of fun too. Uh, that was published in um, spring 2019 and then we opened an exhibition at the Haida Gwaii Museum in June uh, 2019 that we'd been working on Lou and I and the greater uh, museum staff at the Haida Gwaii Museum and the greater Haida repatriation committee. This image was actually I'm not a photographer my photos look horrible but this this image I actually snapshotted at the Royal BC Museum when I was visiting there and when we were looking for a uh, an image to to let everyone know about this exhibition it it became the right one you see you see like like first of all just there'd be so many people related to the artist lou and myself are related to the artist our cousin vince who's also part of repatriation in a big way i kind of think they give a look about how they feel being on the wall you know behind glass and and uh, we are working to to bring those 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 uh, representation of our people home. The exhibition was to communicate the repatriation journey of the Haida Nation, and the the name of the show and the name of our work actually is Yahkutangang to pay respect. We have been working as a Haida Repatriation Committee through our museum, through the Haida Heritage and Repatriation Society, and with independent scholars in our community since about 2005 or more to research, uh, to connect and research with museums around the world. And to date, I believe over 200 museums have been contacted and we're aware right now of, of well over 12,000 physical cultural um, belongings that are spread amongst um, global museums. So what we did was we we uh, hired, hired a scholar, a Haida scholar to collate and collect and, and he'd done a ton of research himself. He presented us with 3,000 images of our ancestral treasures, which we had to then render down to 1500 because we didn't have enough money to do more. Can you imagine if these walls were covered from uh, ceiling to floor, every single wall, it still wouldn't represent what's out there in the world. 
in the we also have images but i don't have them here we had a section to honor our ancestors they're the reason that we're here today they didn't just survive they survived haida identity and they created in the hardest of times an open door that we could walk through when we were ready so then we also had a section of visiting museums and our relationships with with our um, museum friends and also just the act of being there so another part of the exhibit was to put out even though our museum you know has pieces all over the place was to put out uh, examples of how our treasures have come home so over here you can't really see it but there's an argillite pole and that was brought home through the cultural property canada's cultural properties program we had to buy it and they um uh, were able to help us with money this basket here is actually Lu Lucy's old nanai. It was woven by Lucy Frank. And that one uh, came to our museum through, um, I believe it was purchased back in the days when um, there were uh, two Canadian people running the museum. This stone bowl is a, is a very generous and beautiful donation from Donald Ellis. It's, it's an incredible bowl. There's spoons, horn spoons behind it that came from a lovely lady named Nancy Masterman. And, and there's a, a mall, a beautiful mall here that you can't see again, that was came from an excavation on Haida Gwaii. This, this is a bentwood dish that comes through a long-term loan with Parks Canada. And this halibut hook here is actually a new piece uh, carved by Christian White from Old Masset. So there's different ways that we bring ourselves back because this is a traditional hook. Uh, I would like to say most of our collection is built on what I outlined here. Uh, perhaps the earliest repatriation in Canada was the return of some poles from the Royal BC Museum, but then you skip forward to pretty much 2019, and that's pretty much when we got our next repatriation of belongings from uh, Western museums, the UBC Museum of Anthropology and the Museum of Vancouver, who were working on an additional repatriation with. So uh, it was quite a comprehensive exhibition and I as Beth said there's a smaller version of it at the Bill Reed Gallery right now and we're we're really uh, happy that the Bill Reed Gallery would would want to take on this hard subject I think this is the only uh, what you'd call major exhibition on repatriation in Canada Canada possibly you must want to speak about that Lou the exhibition or I, I will say I worked so hard on my holiday when I went went home I thought I was going home for the opening of the the lovely exhibition and Nika put me right to work I got off the plane and she put me right to work helping with the text and help helping you know with the with what the leftovers because it was opening that day and I thought I was just gonna show up and put my lipstick on and go parade around, but no, I had to help out, but that was exactly what I needed to do and that that I'm so so glad I had the opportunity to help you with it, Mika. Um, so how well for putting me to, to work? Um, but how how in incredible that there are just it don't, it just always just hurt hurts my my heart too that there's that many of our belongings out in the world and you know we grew up in the era where there was barely anything here on on Haida Gwaii you know hearing the stories of our relatives you know using paper masks uh, paper bags as masks and you know my nani Grace using a ice cream bucket and a wooden spoon to teach us songs and you know putting crochet crocheted blankets on us for regalia as we danced in her her living room it's just not not right and it just you know it's it hurts hurts my, my heart to to know that all of these belongings are are out there and um i i think our our belongings as much as we are longing for them i think our belongings are longing for us as well and you, you can totally feel that excitement when we're in museums and we're taking out our 
our treasures that that spiritual connection and that joy uh, you know of, of reuniting um that's that's real and you know i think it resonates with each of us and like i was saying earlier about bringing so many different people to museums to to have to be a part of helping other other Haidas have that connection too that's been um a really um meaningful piece of the journey for me i maybe i'll, I'll take out i think you were you were asking me about uh thank you nika she's been helping me with um now that i'm on my phd journey um i'm going to focus my my phd research on the belongings of, of our ancestors and so often other people are writing about our story are telling our story and i feel like it's time for me to tell my my story and write my my story and to be a part of helping us bring home more of our, our belongings so um that i think that's that is my my next calling um in in life i think um i'm just really glad to be home and to be healing from my my previous um experience and to be you know re rethinking what what the creator has in in store for me and i can't wait to see you later tonight to be talking about this nika <laughs> um yeah I, I, I'll, I'll leave it there nika what 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 else can we how are we doing for time Ooh. Hi, it's Beth. I'm joining. I'm going to join back in and uh, maybe facilitate some of the questions. We have a couple of questions, and uh, yes, can you see great. me? Yeah, I just want to maybe I just give a quick wrap up, real yes, quick. Yes, that would be great. I was just trying to get unmuted when Lou passed yeah. it over to yeah. me. So you know, one thing is in Hideaway, there's a there is a way back in the day um, where you call put a string on it. And I think as our ancestors were experiencing what, what they experienced and the ones that didn't make it and the ones that did, um, I think we, we talk about this, they put a string on themselves and to the future generations so that we would be pulled back to them and to our identity. And you know, you just see it. You can just see it, it even within these small little pieces. You know, like like uh, this piece here is is Raven revealing their female self. You know, to find a physical evidence of oral histories we have of Raven's gender fluidity. Or this piece you can't see well, which is of Agwai, which is my clan's principal crest. Um, you know, you you see like here's a frog, so we know that that hat belong to an eagle clan at least we can see that you can see the documentation it tells stories not over not only of uh, pre-contact but of contact too so you know you see a drawing like this this is a drawing made for an anthropologist this is um oh i lost it this is a, a bracelet that was uh, made during contact times. These are models of, of our people, so documenting transition in, in times. And so it's not, some people might think it's limited, you know, to, oh, this is archaic and this is old, but, but, but you know, they want it back. No, this is history. This is everyone's history. And it's, and it's a storybook, an important storybook. And, and we need, we need, we need chapters. We need most of the chapters back because we're putting ourselves back together through that. So, how about Beth? Thank you to you both. I think it's uh, you shared so much and really uh, helped make it so clear how emotional and how much emotion and and. Uh, energy goes into all of these steps. So I really, really appreciate uh, your sharing all of this with us. And I know that um, other there's many questions starting to come up here. Um, maybe one of the first questions that came up uh, was what countries and museums have been helpful to you 
uh, you know, I know that there's a list of almost 200 museums and uh, locations that you've visited. Are there some that stick out that you've really been able to build great relationships with? I, I would say that it's the closer we were to Haida Gwaii, the, the stronger the relationship was is easier to be friends when you can go and visit them um easily right um, um and to start out our journey without really without uh, much internet connection we we weren't able to do this uh we didn't have zoom i think back back in the day or we weren't using it back in the day um nika do you want to speak to any of any of the our, our our good buddies in the museum world uh yeah i would say that the 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 strong and long-standing connections we have with museums were initially formed by us bringing home our relatives that you know it it uh, our our cousin vince he says reconciliation begins at home and we need to, so that is the foundation. You know, our museum started in 76 and that's built on repatriation, but you know, it got so far and it took Lou to, to have the reminders let, or the ancestors let her know that that's where we have to start is with our relatives and taking care of them. So those are some pretty strong relationships, but you can lose them through uh, non-passing down of genealogy within Western museums. So we've had some great relationships and then out of left field, you're like, oh my God, we're starting again. But um, currently I wanna say that through the Haida Gwaii Museum, um, we do have global relationships as, as Lucy maintains them too. So currently, we're working with a museum in Switzerland, uh, the National Museum in Canada, a Berlin Museum, uh, a small museum in England, and the American Museum of Natural History, and the UBC Museum of Anthropology, and the Museum of Vancouver. So we have four staff, and we're working with all of these people on projects actively. Um, because we care about our future and we, we do understand and care about coexistence. But none of those places, except maybe one, have even discussed uh, something coming home. So it's, it's, it's a complicated relationship. It's, it's, uh, someone said once, and I, I'm gonna sound mean, but you know, we gotta start telling more of the backstory that sometimes it feels like museums keep a carrot just enough in front of us that we all move forward, but just enough that we can't complain about not being more forward. And you know, that, that's a reality. There's a question here about how does NAGPRA, the US law about indigenous religious and funerary objects affect the work you do? Does it help or harm your objectives? That's kind of a natural follow up to what you were just talking about, I think. In my experience, and it's it's a, you know it's an experience that that it's it's all of our experiences that there's Western laws that can support repatriation, but more so the laws Western laws or policies often um, co complicate or prohibit repatriations uh, because they're so siloed and um, formulaic. Uh, our, our laws are values that we strive for. We're not perfect, but uh, we also have to honor our laws. And so when we go into a, a Western museum, it, it, Western law doesn't dominate, right? So, so we've been really successful uh, in doing that with a, with a couple of museums in the United States saying, that might be your law, but here's, here's our law. And certainly anything is possible. And we've brought home ancestors across the border. Um, but I don't know if that's a problem other people are having anymore. Oh, there you are. We lost you for a bit. Sorry, guys. I need to hold down the port. I don't know. Bad internet, of course. <laughs> 
Uh, did you want to add anything to that answer, Lucy? Or it was just about NAGPRA and inter cross border laws and Western laws helping or hindering. Oh, what did you say, Mika? <laughs> well, we always talk about there's Western laws, but then we have ours and, and Western laws when we're dealing with us, you know, ourselves, we have to honor and push our, our hideaways. And that's way better than Western law. And the way that we totally grounded ourselves in, in that once we knew how, how we wanted our ancestors to be treated uh, and not treated, you know, that, that just made us stronger and more, um, more, put on more armor to protect our ancestors and our, ourselves. And, you know, sometimes we'd kind of joke about being, being the cute little Canadians with our little task force instead of NAGPRA, right? And acting out of, out of friendship and instead. Um, but that, that, uh, that worked for us. I'm still kind of tr trying to figure it out too about whether do we need legislation in repatriation legislation in in Canada. You're freezing a little bit, I think. Canada, yeah. I kind of go back and forth. Up to, if it came with some some money to. Re okay, moving on. Great. Uh, there's another question um, about Nika's point about shifting responsibility from Indigenous people to settler institutions in relation to repatriation is really an important one. Given the experiences each of you have had, what can be done next to contribute to that critical change, that shifting of responsibility? Well, I'd say, I'm just going to jump in because I'd say the first thing is accepting that our Canadian friends have a privilege of responsibility, right? And to accept they have that responsibility and to not always look to us to provide the answers. Although I'm really glad this question is asked. That's how we can respond. Um, there's a responsibility to learn, you know, don't, don't listen to the rhetoric. Don't listen to the presence of absence in our, in our schools and universities. Don't listen to that. Listen to us and find that guidance and then go do your work and tell others to do that work, educate them. We, we love making friendships. We love sharing our knowledge and, and learning, but, we really need people to pick up their socks and 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 find find pathways. Um, I'm going to ask. Um, we did have a, a question about the idea of the life cycle of the piece, from the creation to the stolen life and the repatriation, if it has been repatriated. And is that ever? presented in museums is that something it seems like it's an important part of the narrative and um, do we need to do better explaining that I think it would be yeah. great if everyone could you know edge like read that indigenous repatriation handbook um, uh, you know a few of us have published uh, academically or elsewhere you know Google Google us and there'll be more stories in there. But wouldn't it be amazing if every institution in Canada, every museum dedicated a, a, a gallery or a permanent exhibit to being able to reveal the history of, of Indigenous peoples in the Canadian government, uh, to be able to tell the story factually, um, we don't have to get ugly, you know, like if you look at our contact and conflict gallery or our repatriation, we don't talk, talk ugly, we give facts. Um, we don't have to make excuses either. So wouldn't that be amazing? Because then the museums would really have to learn. Um, uh, like when I was saying, you know, don't, don't put all the onus on us. Uh, if museums want to contract us to, to do the work, we will help you that way. But we can't always just take phone calls and emails. Um, imagine if every museum acknowledged it was on Indigenous territory, uh, told a brief history or a long history, 
recognized where we are in in society and and where we want to go so i will say that uh having the yakudangang exhibition at the bill reed gallery has been a great eye opener for many people coming through the show in vancouver so unfortunate that during COVID times, our visitor numbers are quite down, but um, it, I think it really does open people's eyes to the idea of um, uh, the, the sheer volume of, of cultural treasures that are around the world. And that this is, a, you're sh sharing the Haida story, but that it's also a story that relates just equally to every other single Indigenous nation in North America and um, which is a very sad thing to start to understand, but also so meaningful. Um, I don't know if I've lost Nika as well. Um, I'm here. Oh, there you are. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I really am sad that Lou, Lou um, uh, uh, connection uh, uh, has not been able to join us again. But I will just take this opportunity to thank you so much for sharing and being so um, willing to talk personally and meaningfully and, and uh, it, it means a huge amount. And I think we've all learned so much. Uh, the recording of the video will be available through the Bill Reed Gallery website and also um, uh, I expect it will be able to have it live in a day or two and uh, I invite people if you to come back and listen again. Um, there was one additional question that related to a totem pole in uh, in Scotland and how people almost see them as decoration and I think I feel that you answered that in your final in your final statement about how the museums where these items are being displayed need to work a bit harder to make sure that the the stories behind the pieces are being shared. So um, thank you so much, Nika, and thank you so much, uh, uh, Lucy, and, and uh, thank you to everybody for attending and for putting up with our small glitches as we learn how to run these webinars. Our next... Uh, Beth, our I'm next... so sorry. I'm going to yes. jump in. Yes, because please do. I think, you know, there's a couple questions here relating to how can institutions change, right? Okay, that's so great. I just want to say... Um, first, there's a lot of people on the ground that in these institutions that want change. So it's also the, the institution itself, the system mm -hmm. that is the core of the challenge we need to overcome. Um, and then also in the Indigenous Repatriation Handbook, there is uh, information there for Western museums wishing to repatriate to Indigenous peoples as well. So however, those questions, I just wanted to try and provide an answer. Right. And we did in the chat put the link to the uh, handbook, uh, which is available online. But as Lucy said, you know, uh, purchasing a copy for your museum if you're or, or organization is a great idea because all of those funds help support repatriation efforts. Uh, so thank you again, everybody. And we will um, look forward to seeing you again at our next event. Uh, we will be hosting a live talk on October 17th at the Bill Reed Gallery, which will also be filmed for future reference. And then we have a couple more uh, events coming up this fall. So please check our website and or Facebook page or sign up for our e-newsletter. Take care, have a great day. Hawa.